You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. There we go. Woo, baby, 100%. Okay, in three, two, one. Welcome to episode 57 of Life in Ruins podcast, where we investigate the careers of those living a life in ruins. I'm your host, Carlton Gover, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Connor Johnnan and David Ian Howe. In this episode, we're getting revolutionary. By that, we're going to talk about the war for independence, the only independence that matters, the American Back independence. <laughs> Overthrow the king. I've taken a revolutionary war class. David's taken revolutionary war class. Connor, have you done your due diligence and service of this great nation? Well, absolutely. I've actually visited these places, gone and, and done that, and read all the books. I read 1776 last year, so when was the last time you guys read that? David McCullough is overrated. He's the Jared Diamond of the American oh, Revolution. Get, get out of here. He's the Graham Hancock of American history. Get out of here, you oh red coat. My name is David McCullough, and I wrote all the oh books about the American get Revolution. I'm not, I'm not going to have this conversation. It's not, no. <laughs> no, it's actually, it's a wonderful book. It's good. <laughs> no, you're just, you're just a how. You're just a freaking red coat. So get out of here. I don't want to hey, hear it. That's true. Ooh. Ooh. Has, Are you hey, related? Is your family? Is, yeah, yeah, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. How long have your family's been here, by the way? Uh, on my dad's side, the Indian side, we are on his well, mom's side, the white side. They've been uh, here since 10,000 BC. Yeah, but like, yeah, no, no, but yeah, side? yeah. My dad's dad is Pawnee. My dad's mom is uh, traces her ancestry to the second voyage to Jamestown. Through that, we're sons of the American Revolution, sons of the Civil War, sons of the Confederacy. We don't like to talk about that one. That's an ancestor <laughs> we just like to forget about. Second, second voyage to Jamestown, huh? Yeah, round, round two. You know, not not much of the hard work. Just uh, once everything your was family, set up. Your family eat some people. I don't your think they did that second blood. round. Wasn't that first round? I mean, once you get the taste for human flesh, like you keep it going, man. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know what was that first or second round. I think that was first round. Yeah, I think we yeah, missed that. I think it was like some third or fourth kid of some earl that they just like got rid of the continent and just sent him to America to die, and then he ended up Big flourishing. <laughs> what about what about you, Connor? Connor, a- British, Irish, German last name? Johan. We're much later, like, uh, I think we're like 1890s, early 1900s, so we're late, latecomers to this place. Tisk tisk. What I about mean, you, no, Mr. Cool. Uh, cool. Mr. Corporal Lieutenant Howe, Admiral Howe, uh, what are you? Uh, he was General Howe, thank you. My mom's side, obviously, Ellis Island-ish, uh, early 1900s, and then my my dad's side has been here on his British, like, Howe's British, right? And then there's okay. McCoy is our Scottish name. And the British side's been here since like 15 something. I think they were sailors and then they were farmers up in upstate New York. We have no Iroquois DNA whatsoever. So that's either good or bad. Uh, I don't know. And then we'll figure that one out later. And then um, having lived there for so long, you know, you'd, you'd think. But the other thing is the Scottish side came over as indentured servants. I think her name was Agnes Macomb. You got to say it the right way. Agnes Macomb. And she came over. Oh, Agnes! <laughs> as, uh, Agnes, make experiment. me some haggis. <laughs> All right, we're getting borderline here, um, but yeah, she was here, and then um, the house side and the McCombs side married, and I think, yeah, we've been upstate New York for a long while. Excellent. So we have we have a, a pretty original New Yorker, pretty OG Virginian, and then whatever Connor is, his whenever they had the whole showing up when the place was already set up yeah like what, what's the deal why they come so late you know? <laughs> I, I have no idea I haven't, I haven't done a ton of research into that um we were we are welsh irish <laughs> german so we 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 came along uh a little a little later on are you are you related to william howe in, at all or any of those those clowns so uh according to my dad and like the genealogy tree i don't think we're related to that how because we had come over before that but he definitely has the how last name and there's probably some distant thing like overseas or something but i'm pretty sure our family was like pretty poor it's why they came over here they were like oh we got no bread we got come over here farm the vikings my lord, my lord. <laughs> <laughs> i guess we'll go to rochester new york it sounds exotic <laughs> hope we don't get clubbed by the seneca back in the day that was pretty exotic place to live so it was. i guess we're going to start with kind of since this is the revolutionary war episode war of independence a lot of you guys have been asking us to do more like history and tie it in with archaeology so we want we want to provide we're here for you we deliver 
So I've always been interested in the Revolutionary War. That it's always been like one of the most interesting things for me. It's the it's the war that felt that felt right. You know, that America was that, that America was fighting for itself. And America. Yeah, we're fighting for ourselves, defending our freedom. And it was kind of this interesting like rebellion war where we like crapped on the British. And I really, really enjoyed that as part of that. But the more research you get into, the more complex you, re- you realize this this war was. It was like there's a lot of facets to what was going on yeah. during this. I mean, like realistically, we didn't kick the crap out of the British. They just there's just so much going on in the world that they just did right. not have time for us anymore. And that's <laughs> something I wanted to to bring up too, because it's like we think of the revolutionary like our our history starts with that. You know, we get Columbus and some yada yada and then like the Revolutionary War, and then, but like the French and Indian War or the Seven Years' War and the Revolutionary War was like not even a huge deal to the Brit. They, they were in India, they were colonizing Australia, they were in South Africa dealing with that, doing all sorts of things, and they were just like ah, those freaking Yanks, and they had to like deal with us, and we were like, hey, we don't want to be taxed without no representation, you know, <laughs> even though we just say this because it's catchy, it doesn't mean anything really. And that's really what happened. Didn't really mean anything. They just it just rhymed. That's kind of what my the book that I read told us. But yeah, so it was just kind of like a foreign war for the British, and they were just like, Ugh. it's like if we had a colony on Mars, and they were like, hey, we want we want to be our fifty first state, like Puerto Rico or, or DC, and we're like, Ugh. all right, whatever. <laughs> well, and it's it's like so like just to get reinforcements from England to here, what's what it would take months, right? So it's like. Yeah, there was like no twelve turns in Civ. <laughs> yeah, twelve turns in Civ. That's how we measure time these days. Yeah, and so like, just they were at a disadvantage just from the start, just by geography and. That's true. You do get plus three movement. <laughs> if anyone's listening, they know that they're <laughs> loving that. Or if you don't know what that means, you're like, "What? I'm going to turn this off at this point." So please and, do. And also, General and Admiral Howe. So the general that was in charge of land uh, forces the and the brothers, yes, mm-hmm. and Admiral. Not only were they tasked by King George V with quelling the rebellion, but they're also charged with resuming diplomatic ties. So they they were trying to not go hard as they could because they were also supposed to be the diplomats at the same time. So it was kind of like a catch-22 for them. So they couldn't effectively do their job as military men and they couldn't effectively do their job as diplomats because they were trying to do the same thing. I'll go into that story here, just clear the air. General Howe uh, was part of um, Bunker Hill. Like according to like the books, it sounds like he got PTSD from the battle because it was just brutal. This is the land guy. This isn't the sea one. I think this is William Howe was on land. I don't, Seals McGee was on water. I don't remember his name. <laughs> is it but Richard Howe? He, Admiral? Something like that. Yeah. Uh, the Admiral. Yeah. But Seal General McBeal, Howe, the Navy Seal. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> William Howe, I believe, like, if you read about what happened, he was like, I'm going to go, I'm not, this was tough. Like, Bunker Hill was just a a bloodbath, and he was like, this is terrible. And then he was supposed to go to the Ohio River Valley to fight Washington there, but instead he chose to get drunk and gamble himself, or gamble himself into, like, a drunken stupor in Manhattan, as most Howes would do, you know he didn't go and that's why washington kind of won the the western theater but i mean there's there's multiple factors to that but i thought it was interesting because that's part of when you look back at history and you know you have like the the lgbtq you know critique or the feminist critique the things right you can look at it and be like okay were lewis and clark maybe homosexual uh together like that's that's a whole debate um i don't think it is but you can also look back at things and be like PTSD was not a thing at that time, her mental illness. So like, I mean, you were just either crazy or not, according to them. So you can look back and be like, huh. And that was a big topic in the class we had was like, is there evidence of, you know, that kind of stuff in in history that we, isn't written down? Because no one's going to write like, I had shell shock. <laughs> right. Know. Yeah. We're skipping ahead some steps. We have to, we got to, we got to dial it back. So how, why did the revolutionary war started? Yeah. We're 12 minutes in. Let's do this. We did six minutes of no Irish need apply, so we need to like catch up with yeah. the actual episode. <laughs> That's a hundred years later. So David mentioned the Seven Years' War. That is a pretty pivotal moment for background to the Revolutionary War. David, what is your synopsis of the Seven Years' War and why that's critical? To what happens? Like, was what it 10, 10 years, fifteen years later? That's like seven. 12, 15. Yeah. Yeah. Was it seven, seven? years? Yeah, it's seven years' war. 
Well, yeah, it was <laughs> seven years long, but it was really, okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Carter. You there. <laughs> seven years war was like literally a world war, and that was going on between Europe. Uh, I think it was was this one about religion or was it just territory? I mean, they all have to do with religion. Um, and territory, like that. yeah. Territory, religion, Germany. You know, going at Holy Roman Empire at the time. The Ottomans were doing something. Uh, the whole thing. There's a bunch of stuff in like I think Scandinavia too. Essentially, the Seven Years' War was also again for the British. We're like literally the frontier. It's like we're on Pandora and Avatar out here living. And it's like the French had their territory up to the Mississippi, you know, like what we got the Louisiana Purchase from. And then we had, or Britain had, you know, up to the Appalachians. The Seven Years' War here, the French and Indian War for us, Seven Years' War for the world was like the British just fighting the the French and uh, allied indigenous tribes, their na- I guess nations at the time, but I forget which ones. There was there's a lot. I know the Cherokee yeah. on the British side. But. Yeah, so that that's one of those misnomers. Like there were indigenous on the British side too, as there yeah. are through most American wars. It's just whoever paid them more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I know with the Iroquois Confederacy, there was one group, like four out of the five of the Confederacy sided with the British, one sided with the French. And then they lost. And then later, when the American Revolution happened, the ones that sided with the French sided with the Americans and kind of through the American Revolution. Got the whole, we're, yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself again. But yeah, Roy, it, was, uh, and it effectively kicked France out of the New World for a while. As a power. Uh, as yeah. a power until they got it back later with the whole Louisiana purchase. Well, they, they had the land, but Napoleon had just taken over France and he was like I don't want to deal with this here's this at half off and T- Thomas Jefferson was like all right and that's it was like kind more of than happened. half off it was like a 95 <laughs> percent yeah he sale. Just was like I do not want this <laughs> but yeah that's kind of what but they were here before that and like the whole middle America up through Canada and stuff was French which is how you 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 got your last name right uh like a hundred hundred years later yeah most mm-hmm. of Canada was French too yeah, French kind of nah is the best kind of dog. <laughs> South Park. <laughs> um, you guys just want to end it here and go a little longer in the next segment and actually talk about what's going on? I, I was going to just well, I guess we that. could talk about the Intolerable Acts real quick because we don't need to go too depth in that because the Seven okay, Years' yeah. War, Britain was bankrupt, started taxing, Chain George V was in there, and that's where we get the Intolerable Act, like the Stamp Act, the T Act a couple others that really made it hard for colonists to be financially stable in the States in the colonies at that time as part of the whole colonial system is uh, colonists could not make things on their own. Typically they had mm-hmm. to be imported from Britain. And that's actually one of the first sites I worked at is finding a bunch of like out, out in Northern Virginia looking for um, black market potters. Really? Yeah, because they they basically it was basically the old time moonshine. You go out to the Appalachians and you make some pottery, so you didn't have to buy it from the Brits. Did some some chemical analysis on skeletons. There was a whole thing, but that was what actually one of my first projects was working on a colonial site and also looking for one of George Washington's star forts in Loudoun County, Virginia, which was in someone's backyard in Leesburg. That's Google wild. Maps. Google Maps. You see a lot of some of the generals, army, military folks appear in the, the Seven Years' War um, and get experience in the Seven Years' War and the French and Indian right. War that ultimately like play big parts in, in, in the Revolutionary War. So that's kind of some of that other, other in influence that you get from this time period. That's how Washington came to fame, too. He, he was a general or some kind of corporal or something like that in that army or that war. And, and the Patriot, too, I think Mel Gibson's character had... That's where he got his tomahawk from, was like the French and Indian War. Yep. Um, and at this but, time, Ohio was under the domain of Virginia. Yeah, Washington in French and Indian. He was like a colonel or something. He was really famous for losing. <laughs> but with grace. Yeah, he knew yeah. how to lose, which became pivotal later on. Yeah. If, if only I learned that skill. And on that note, we will end this segment and go on to uh, segment two. And this is episode... 57 or something. It's pretty crazy. It's revolutionary. Welcome back to segment two of episode 57 of Life Nerds podcast. As Connor said in a corny joke, we're talking about the Revolutionary War. We kind of went on a, a long tangent last time, but let's get back like, to you know the brass tacks here. It, for those like non-US listeners here, the 13 colonies were Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, and then New York, New Jersey, uh, Vermont. New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Not Vermont. 
Pennsylvania. Not Vermont. Vermont Pennsylvania. was part of Nash- Yeah, Vermont was part of New Hampshire, and Maine belonged Maine to Massachusetts. Maine was part of Massachusetts. Yes. Yeah, and that like Maine is just Maine is called Maine because it's like there's the mainland, but most of Maine is in the islands scattered on the coast. So that's why it was part of Massachusetts. So they just was like, all right, we'll sail up there and call it that. But and as Carlton mentioned. We had a lot of colonists here. Like it was a very populated area. New York is obviously a big city. New York was like a perfect port city. It was well defended. Uh, you have to sail up the coast of Long Island to get up there, and then you can send everything up the the river and you send it back to England or wherever. And uh, the other, like Philadelphia, was right there on those like the, the tri-state area: Philadelphia, New Jersey, New York City, all right there. But as we were talking about before, there's a lot of you know, we're far away from Britain. There's a lot of like government that can't really be done here. It's all done remotely. You can't Zoom call and, you know, talk to people. It took like months to go by ship. And like things like the the Stamp Act, like literally taxed playing cards, like to an astronomical amount. And like, wh- what else do you do but play like, what's the game where you stab your hand on the table? Um, <laughs> that doesn't involve Pokemon. cards. That's five finger uh, filet. And there are no cards involved. Right. So you either you had that's that. Free. Yeah, that's you, you free. Could, yeah. You could do that. You could watch the whale oil lamps like burn down and then you could feel bad about whales and then you could play <laughs> cards. And then they were like, all right, you know what? P- card tax me 50%. And then they were like, oh, let's go dump some tea. So the, <laughs> you want to talk about the Boston Tea Party? Yeah, well, that's yeah. nuts. I, I, I want to mention keep- real, something real quick. So uh, Carl- Carlton did mention the Intolerable Acts, but these are right. kind of the responses to these sugar, the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act, Molasses Act, and like Carlton's going to explain for the Boston Tea Party. So people probably don't understand, like they didn't send like tea leaves. When we're talking about the Boston Tea Party, when a bunch of drunk college students and people forget the people that founded this country did so at a bar and they were college (laughs) students in their early 20s, got drunk and founded this country. So Fox News, when you talk about, you know, the founding fathers, you're talking about radical college students. Bernie bros that actually had a plan. (laughs) Kind of. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the the Articles of Confederacy didn't really work out that well for a while, but that's no. after the war. Um, tea was shipped in these like bricks and you would shave off a couple sh- like shavings. That's what went in your tea. So when we're talking about crates being dumped into the harbor, it wasn't like tea leaves. It wasn't like bags of twinnings. They were literal, <laughs> just like was pallets too. of pure concentrated tea juice it was like millions of dollars worth of tea that were just dumped into the harbor yeah and they, not not they, like a plantation's worth it was literally like a country's worth of tea <laughs> pressed into these bricks and then just thrown into boston harbor boston harbor boston harbor, the harbor. The in there. and they did they dressed up as indigenous people right or is that like a myth yeah oh, they no, did I think, yeah that's <laughs> yeah that's kind of they the were, question yeah, yeah dress up as the indians we don't right, care we about started them. appropriating way back then we still haven't figured that out so let's you know come on guys and then and then a hundred years from now we can have a football team and we can honor them <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh connor do you have something to say i was just gonna say i think i just i picturing like twinnings I wonder if they like tied all the tops together and they like lifted them out of the habit just to make sure the tea comes <laughs> out <crane>? right. <laughs> yeah, that, those fish must have been caffeinated for a good minute, but like <laughs> um, probably there's no fish there anymore. I think I had a trivia question one time and it was like, what is one of the, like, the oldest tea? And it was like the tea dumped in the Boston, 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 Boston tea party. And I think it was Twinnings. Like the company's has been around that long. Uh, I could be wrong. That trivia, trivia is always wrong. I always have to go up was there. Was the East India Trade Company guy. was up that? It Was it? Because East, East India, India was, was a big thing. And yeah. then also Hudson Bay was also another one at that time. Yeah. Competing. Um, and also like a difference that David was talking about, the northern states, more industrial, far more populated, right. um, far more independent just based on the colony status. Because you're talking about a lot of religious radicals that were kicked out of Europe to basically they threw them to the new world to either starve or just get out of Europe. Yeah. And then the south. So like Virginia, good old Virginia and southward were mostly plantations, uh, wealthy Abrarian. folks, yeah, and had strong ties to England because they were producing a lot of cotton, which we'll get into later why that difference between North right. and South matters, especially at this moment. Tobacco, cotton, and rice. Rice was big in South Carolina, tobacco, Virginia, like all of the Mid-Atlantic, and then 
the South was just cotton, cotton, yeah. cotton. And Georgia um, wasn't that big at this time. It was mostly set up to be a buffer between the colonies and New Spain. Yeah. So it was like it was kind of like Luxembourg. Not many people. Kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Well, Oglethorpe like founded. It was a penal colony at first too. Like it was oh, like Australia. I didn't know that. It was yeah. And then uh, I think it's like there's like oh it's a myth and but like I, they did bring uh, like indentured servants and criminals here to work the plantations um, and like do other things at first. But Georgia also Atlanta was a city. Augusta actually. Uh, Savannah obviously being a big British city. It's, if you go there now, it's beautiful and it, like you can see like the little cobble roads and stuff. Uh, but Augusta itself being inland a bit was actually a British armory. Uh, and they like sailed it up the river so that they didn't get like destroyed on the coast. It's actually pretty smart. And then I work in a, an old cotton mill, which is wild. Yeah. Anyway, uh, moving on. The Oh, let me add one more thing. You could you could yeah. call like New England its own like separate thing too. They kind of had their own culture kind of, they were very like banded together as like a community. And I think things definitely happened different and were sparked kind of in this, this new England area almost being like yeah. this, this larger, the, the British maybe seeing them as like a representation of what America is, but it was super sure. diverse. And you, like you said, the cotton, cotton, different, different industries, um, different people. It was as a very diverse white <laughs> As, as, yeah, as, as as much you can get, but like New German, England, British, are, yeah, I yeah, mean. but yeah, New England was like this interesting place where all these things started sparking, like these the Boston Tea Party, and you you get the first couple battles of the Revolutionary War after um, the Intolerable Acts really occurring in this New England area, and you know, I, it wasn't like everyone was on the same page, like oh, we should op- absolutely you know, go, go to war with England and, and, and try to get our freedom and anything like that. It, it, it sparked in one kind of place and everyone else was like, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, we also had the government structure kind of set up because even prior to the revolutionary war, there was already kind of these lower houses of just colonists setting up their own smaller government, government, governments. And then you kind of led to some of the Southern states ended up doing their own economic sanctions against Britain and stopped sending trade their way. And once again, radical college students doing a lot of this stuff. And that that's Connor was getting at that too. Like up North had a lot of those prestigious colleges where like people, you know, didn't really farm. They were either sailors or they made rope or, you know, something like that. But they, they went, uh, you went to college up there, like Yale, Harvard, it's all, Harvard's older than the country. And like, you went up there and did that kind of stuff. But down South, there are a few colleges for sure, but it wasn't as populous and you couldn't, you could get to Newark from New York city by like literally swimming across the river. So it was like more concentrated. And those are the issues that bled into the civil war, why there was such a difference between the North and the South. It's like a different culture. Um, and that's why the, the British helped the South because they were like, Hey, we need some of that cotton <laughs> and like needed that back. So but, yeah, the Southern yeah. campaign was more of like a civil war within the colonies rather than like an all out rebellion. It was no bueno. If you watch the Patriot, they kind of tag on this a little bit. It. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's the loyalists that really occurred down there in like large numbers. Um, so, and then, so we get the, the tea party and you get, the colonies kind of responding to this by creating the first con- continental Congress, which is 12 of the 13 British colonies. Georgia didn't get the memo. They're just down Fragile. there. eating, Yeah. Down there eating peaches or whatever they do down there <laughs> to, to, to kind of at least to, to, to try to organize in some sort of fashion to organize as a country, whatever. So that's, that's kind of like the, the next step and nothing really happens. <laughs> they just, yeah, really- Massachusetts really starts things off. You have the Boston Massacre, which was kind of caused by the colonists. The partial repeal of Townshed Act. And just kind of like there's these little things going on. The British Oof. are kind of responding. I didn't think about that. Uh, yeah. Boston Massacre is like we got a history of uh, uh, police and false flag. misunderstandings. <laughs> false flag yeah. operations. Yeah. Honestly, the first one was right there. Yeah. Yeah. And John Somebody Adams defended the... Uh, the, the, the Brits. soldiers. And yeah. they, he, he, he won successfully. Yeah. He got um, a lot of credit and he stood his ground like, nah, we got to do this right. And some drunk up- idiot was like, fire. And like the <laughs> British were like, oh, psh, all right. And fire. Like that's how he won the debate. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. And then also like the East India Trade Company almost goes under in 1773. So really like worldwide, things aren't great for Britain to like not tax the states. 
And even still, like in back home in England, they thought the colonists were pretty lazy. And they're like, they're ungrateful because we helped protect them from the French and those dirty savages. Right. And, it and it's six months delayed propaganda. As, yeah. Me. It was six months delayed propaganda that they heard. So like most people didn't really know and then, when they were like, yeah. We even sent like representatives and to, to, to try from from um, the colonies to England to at least have, have conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Have conversations yeah. with folks and be like, OK, we want some sort of representation here to ultimately it, it it's not all radical there was some negotiation there was like attempts yeah to really and, re- rectify that yeah there was uh, a lot of moderates within the continental congress that did not especially some of the pennsylvanians quakers who did not believe in violence right um the people in the south like we talked about they made a lot of money off of britain like they made they made quite a bit sending their goods off and the trading with the british and you know doing all that and they had an economic and like reason to stay British. That's why a lot of them were loyalists. But uh, I sent Connor and Carlton like my final exam notes from the class that I had. And the, the essay question was like, it can be argued there were two separate revolutions, one that took place on the battlefield and one that occurred in the political arena. And that's what Connor is getting at. Like there was a lot of diplomacy that went into it. And honestly, it was like, I mean, despite them being like kind of, you know, they had slaves and like didn't probably were pretty racist at the time, but like, they were pretty intelligent dudes. Like Carlton said, they were like in their early twenties, uh, some thirties. I think Ben Franklin was like probably like eighty. I'm just kidding. Yeah, he was <laughs> eighty, and he was still getting around too. He people was going don't to Paris realize doing this thing. Yeah, Ben Franklin was a horn dog. You read some of those letters he was sending to people, like sending young girls, like you make my soldiers stand at attention. Like the dude would have been canceled today. <laughs> so the- he was the Cristalia of the revolution. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, All right, what it is. That's <laughs> uh, what it is. But um. Yeah, th- like a lot of it took place there. And like if you read the de- – we're, we're getting ahead here. But like if you read the Declaration of Independence, mostly written by Thomas Jefferson, like it's a brilliant piece of like literature. Like it's just a huge F you to the established government. And it's like – it's such flowery, like intense verbiage that the king was just like, all right. Yeah, I mean, and I, then I so think- they sent the house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think I think like Carlton said, it's really interesting – they they were ultimately like they had their hands tied in New York. They could have wiped out Washington because they you ultimately get you know commanders on each side and folks you know ultimately goes to war after the, I don't know exactly when the Battle of New York was, but the Battle of Brooklyn, all that stuff. Like they the the Howes were ultimately just trying to not be complete dicks. You know they're yeah, not tra- they, they're not they cared. They're, yeah, and they're not trying to wipe out Washington because they could have. And on multiple occasions, you know, Washington really didn't, wasn't up an experienced commander and, and really messed up in New York ultimately and just got lucky. Yeah. And they didn't want to burn the place down because they needed it for money. Like right. they, like the whole purpose of keeping the colonies was to support the British Empire. Um, and yeah, and it's like, I always think it's interesting how like at that Continental Congress, when they're trying to figure out who's going to lead the army, you know, George Washington shows up in uniform. And it's like, well, if you're going to give it to me, I guess so. Like, I don't really want it. It's like, really, George? You just dress up for no reason? <laughs> right. Like, you're kind of, really? Come on, big guy. You six foot goat teeth wearing moron. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I think we started this session or section on like the intolerable acts and like what happened. So like, why did we declare war? Like what, what happened there? Or like, when, when did it become that? And like, we had Lexington and Concord and all that. Yeah. Massachusetts went off. Um, Lexington and Concord, the shot heard around the world. And then Bunker Which Hill happened. Pff, no. Lexington and Concord is up north, dude. Is it, isn't Jersey? That's like the whole. Is. Maybe it is. Jersey. Yeah, that's the whole um, the British are coming thing. The Paul Revere. So uh, it's Jersey. Yeah, they were basically the British started rounding up people's guns. <laughs> and then the, the people said, you're not taking our guns. <laughs> and then they shot the British. Like, Which is where they the, were the, the superpower at the time. Comes from. Yeah, yeah, they were they were the superpower. It was it was just, oh gosh, a different time. A different time. Yeah, one if by land, two if by sea, kind of thing like this. The British are coming. The British come and attack. Uh, but we, we had sent the Declaration of Independence is what started the war, right? Or was it they just came and attacked first and then we did that stuff later? I can't recall been a few years let me double check because i think bunker hill 
happened prior to all the colonies. So finally declaring war. Yeah, that's uh, one nation kind of thing. Lexington and Concord were 1775. When, when was Bunker Hill? Because that's it's all kind of so Lexington and Concord are are some of the battles. And Bunker Hill occurs in 1775 as well. Um, And I think these are all ultimately connected. And you have these militias that are coming and being formed in Massachusetts and and other local communities down there to, you know, kind of respond to these Lexington and Concord stuff. And then you have the Battle of Bunker Hill, which is intense and awful and just, oh, God. Lexington, Concord and Bunker Hill happened in June. Okay. Declaration of Independence was July 3rd, and then everyone got the word on the 4th. That's that little faux pas with independence. It's like they signed it on the 3rd. They didn't let the country know till July 4th. Mm. Yeah, And uh, someone just said that Bunker Hill was a bloodbath. And like, if you look at it on Wikipedia, the uh, total casualties on the British side were... 450 and on the the British side or no the what that's not No, right. the British lost 1000. 1000 and the the um the colonists lost 450. They the British charged 3 times like mowed down at point blank range and still took the ground. Like they were not playing. Right. And that plays into I don't know if it was that battle specifically but part of the I was going to say this before uh, again, the British and like the colonies extended from the coast up to the Appalachians. So like you went to the mountains and over that was indigenous territory. You know, they kept encroaching. But like Tennessee was the wild frontier at this time. So like nothing out there was like settled, really. Uh, people were moving out there, but it wasn't like a civilization yet in, in the European sense. So a lot of what helped us win the war, especially in these like huge numbered battles that are stacked against us, was guerrilla warfare. And like... That's like make sure to show that in the Patriot, but like we could like hide in trees. We knew the land really well, but the British were coming here doing their like lined warfare with their muskets, and we're like fa, and we were just like swinging from trees, like clubbing people with tomahawks. And yeah, was, like, that's wild. that whole swamp fox thing, which Patriot is loosely based off of. Oh, okay. The Southern War was a very different war, which is like kind of interesting with like Lord Cornwallis, who was the lieutenant commandant, I think, of the theater. He reported to Howe. Right. But he was in charge of the Southern campaign and it was a lot of loyalists fought for the British. They started in Charleston and just kind of made their way up. They were largely successful. I mean, the most of the campaign in the Americas is largely successful on behalf of the British. The Americans are really good just after they lost a battle, being able to retreat in order to maintain the army. Mm-hmm. And then they were able to rally when it met, when it mattered. And uh, with that, we're going to rally for uh, segment three. We'll be right back with episode 57 of Life and Rose podcast. So real quick in the uh, in between times, we realized we can't cover everything we want in one whole episode. So we'll, uh, the next Angry Girls episode will be Revolutionary War Part 2 so we can get everything that we love about this amazing moment of our country's history where we uh, definitely got rid of those the lobster backs from this great nation of ours and sent them back into the sea where they can enjoy their limes. Eat it, Stefan. Talking to you, Natasha. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. All right. So <laughs> I think I guess uh, I think we, I, I think we wanted to end it on just kind of uh Washington crossing the Delaware and ultimately not destroying his army and kind of the importance of that. And David, do you wanna kinda of go into that? Yeah. Sure. So like I talked about like the frontier aspect of the war. All that got won by the Americans. Like we pushed that back and we defended that because like I said, the guerrilla warfare and all that. I mean, for the most part we did. But Britain conquered new york like i grew up on long island and it was just a british stronghold like there's british like from the war there's like old houses and stuff you can visit and homesteads and things like that and brit long island was very much like a british like battle of brooklyn and all that and manhattan once you control manhattan it's so inland like up in the waters there that like you're not getting rid of it so the british took that and then a lot of the theater happened over and the bloody battles happened over here on the East coast. One of those like retorts to that after the British like took Philadelphia or took uh, New York was Washington kind of sailed up the, from Philadelphia or down Philadelphia up the Delaware river. Was it up or down? Can't remember exactly where he was, but anyway, he crossed the Delaware river, which is part of Philadelphia. And on Christmas Eve of 1776, 75, 
I yeah, so we missed Valley Forge though. Valley Forge is pretty important. That because the whole, as David said, uh, originally George Washington's whole battle strategy was to retake New York, and if you retook New York, they they saw that as the key to winning independence. Mm-hmm. After you got kicked out, they wintered in Valley Forge and almost starved to death. And then, as he was getting chased out of New York, I think also out of Philadelphia. Yeah. Because that was the capital of the Continental Congress and the first capital of the country. As they were retreating, they had to cross the Delaware. Yeah, which it was uh, 1776. I just looked it up. And this was midnight. The British had hired, like the British had the money. So they had like Indian soldiers. They had an Indian in terms of like India. Feather uh, not dot. Oh my gosh. India, well, you can say that I can't. Indian soldiers, uh, and they also hired uh, German mercenaries, and they had Highlanders from Scotland who came and like were pretty uh, well, like part of like they were sharpshooters and things like that too. The Hessians were German mercenaries that were like very good, like they they hired them for this reason for warfare, and uh, Washington was like, uh, yeah, we don't really want to like fight them on the battlefield, so let's just cross the Delaware on Christmas Eve and kill them in their sleep. Uh, in the typical American fashion. So we did that. Uh, and that was like, that's that, that huge painting. I forget who painted that, but if you think a German it, guy, and that's why there's ice in the river, because that's how the rivers freeze it. in Germany. Uh-huh. They get icebergs in German rivers. So he'd never seen it. And so that's why there's icebergs in, but that's not what happens in the States. But yeah, they crossed cool. to get away. And then they were trying to like, we need to get out of here. Cause if that freezes over the, the British are going to march over. And George Washington had this plan, like, wait a minute, what if we cross again and sneak up on the Hessians on Christmas Day because our winter enlistments are about to run out. Yeah, our our winter enlistments are going to fall. And also, like, we need a win or else this whole idea of independence is gone. And he, uh, I think Gates wanted nothing to do with it. And Washington kicked him out and told him, your troops stay here. And if you utter a word about this, I will hang you. Hmm. Because him and Gates did not get along. They had a pissing match. Really? I didn't know that. Washington yeah. Gates? Yep. Didn't know that. Connor? According to the movie. Oh, no, I think, yeah, they were the tw- two people kind of vying for control of the the army. And just as a clarification, Valley Forge occurs after after the crossing of the Delaware. So it's 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 part oh, of the retreat. Yeah, that's fine. No, no, it's okay. No, it's just, I think it's a part of that retreat, ultimately, out of Trenton, out of New Jersey, and finding that, that place and that... And, wintering in 1777 and 1778 yep. valley forge yeah, yeah, yeah. two years yeah. later yeah which was again the frontier so cold there was just forts out there it wasn't like you couldn't go to the city and like live inside it was bad i think the uh the last of the mohicans takes place before the revolution but like if you want to understand like what the frontier looked like that's a really good example mm-hmm. just like desolate full of indigenous tribes and stuff like that and you know just scattered homesteads but nothing like urban which is like how it's usually painted in films. But after all these defeats and like, you know, the subtle victories of killing people in their sleep on Christmas, Han Solo comes to the rescue. And Connor, you want to talk about that? Han Solo. I mean, I think it's a good place. Han Solo. If we we end it there and just say that this crossing of the Delaware was hugely inspirational and, and kept the war effort alive ultimately because like Carlton mentioned that the the enlistments the were running out in terms of what soldiers had committed to for serving the the military so this is ultimately something that we get inspiration from and allows us to continue this war and if it didn't happen I I doubt we continue and I doubt we really actually mm-hmm. be, get independent yeah 900 uh-huh. hessian prisoners oh, that's, wow. that's that's a lot. lot and they lost like 7 Continentals, like hugely inspirational. And it was also payback because the Hessian colonel, Johann Rahl, was a monster. And he was known for just butchering Sounds like he would uh, of America, of, of uh, revolutionaries. So even after they surrendered, I imagine he's pretty, he's like the German version of the guy from the Patriot on horseback. Oh, just, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? The main oh, yeah, antagonist. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, Malfoy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that guy. Yes, yeah, it's Malfoy. Yeah. Um, but you, you missed my Han Solo reference. Who comes to the rescue in the revolution after this? The French? Yeah, we got to talk about the French. What the? F- Han Solo? 
Yeah, they come in at the last minute, help fund us, bring us troops, bring us food, bring it like they help win the war. Oh, really? uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's well, a pretty big the, thing. I think but we'll that's take, that's the next episode. Yes, we'll take. Oh, the, is that yeah, is that okay? Because we still yes. have like four years of war. We're only in seventy six. This thing doesn't end until right, like eighty eighty one. We'll tease it, but it's a big thing. The French yeah. come and help, or else we wouldn't have won. I think. <laughs> when do we get our own uh, German guy who trains the troops? Oh. You guys know what I'm talking about? Are you talking mm. about the French guy, Mark Marquis de? No, 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 no. He's he's German. And his big thing is he's gay. Really? Yeah. He turns out that people realize now he probably left Germany because he was a homosexual. Mm. Um, what was his name? But he basically came and retrained the Continental Army in the North as a fighting European style army. His name was Hans Zolo. Uh, Friedrich <laughs> Wilhelm von Steuben. Von, See, Sch- von Steuben. Yes, von Steuben. And they say it the best in in The Last Samurai. When you understand a language, everything falls into place. But if you are being yelled at by a large German in German, you will listen and you will fire better. <laughs> Baron it's just a thing. Friedrich Wilhelm von Steuben. Von yeah. Steuben. It's a, it's von a, what's his name? <laughs> he's Bar- Russian, He's a yeah. Baron. Yeah, Baron Friedrich Wilhelm von Steuben. Yeah, I can't even read it. But yeah, he had he brought his Italian greyhound Azor with him. Uh, That's an excellent post right there. Let's do that. Yeah, well, uh, so we'll continue talking about Friedrich von Wilhelm von Steuben, Baron, whatever his name is. um, It basically compared him to the Roman god of Mars. Like that's how American soldiers saw him. So he's the dude from Troy. That's Ajax. Yeah, it's just (laughs) in pictures of him. He is very German. And very large and uh yeah he yep turned turned a bunch of volunteers a bunch of ragtag uh volunteers into a into an army so so yeah, yeah we'll continue that hang girls part two revolutionary war whatever whenever that is i think it's be like <laughs> four we might have to do part three <laughs> yeah yeah so um big thing i wanted to mention kind of like some experiential thing which is it's going to be a different it's like slightly tangential right before the COVID happened the the January before I was lucky enough to visit Boston and kind of go to these places that occurred these these important buildings locations in this early Revolutionary War period uh, you know the Bunker Hill Monument the the Meeting House whatever it's called all these kind of places and I know you guys you guys grew up kind of on the East Coast yeah how 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 was that experience of visiting these kind of these places especially when they're surrounded by big cities and how how did you feel when you ultimately went to these places as a kid i was just playing pokemon blue on my thing and i didn't really care (laughs) but like i said like long island is a british stronghold we went to boston all the time to see family we went to philadelphia and like you see all that stuff and it's like that's the oldest part of the country to us like obviously we're not in the spanish part I currently live in what is now or what was new Spain right now. That's kind of cool, I guess. But like, yeah, that part, it's like the history, it's just so much of it. And as a kid, like I grew up with that. And I think we was telling this to Maddie McAllister when we had her on, but like looking at it in context now, it's like, I grew up in the colonies. Like, and I live in one right, right now. Like I was part of the British colonial empire that connects me to Australians and South Africans and people in India. It's just a weird like thing to think about. Like we're here because of that. But when I talked with you, like growing up out West, like things aren't as old and like you have like Oregon trail and like mining stuff, I guess. But like, that's really it. If you want to talk about that or Carlton, do you want to go? I was born in New Mexico in a colony of Spain, then moved to a, the Russian colony of Oregon. And then yeah, to the, the English colony of, of Virginia. But uh, growing up outside of D.C., of course, the Revolutionary War is a huge aspect. You know, we have all the monuments. We go to the Smithsonian's. A lot of things are named either after Revolutionary War figures or Confederate generals. That is now being changed. <laughs> Robert E. Lee High School is no longer Robert E. Lee High School. Uh, <laughs> and a big part, like in fourth grade is our big in the state of Virginia – the, that's when you do Virginia history. And so, of course, we learn about like the House of Burgesses, which is like the first government body in the New World, which is in um, outside of uh, Williamsburg. Williamsburg, Virginia is a big place. Colonial Williamsburg is great when you're an adult, boring as hell yeah. when you're a kid. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's so hot. It's so humid no matter when yes, you go. <laughs> but it's right next yeah. to Bush Gardens, uh, which is that's always true. a fun place. And so we had to visit Jamestown. 
And also next to Jamestown, pretty close is Yorktown. So we got to go visit those battlefields and some of those early significant places, um, especially uh, as kids. So we were always around it. And uh, I remember like one of my earliest memories probably of archaeology was like visiting Jamestown and seeing the ongoing excavations. Yep. Shout out the person yeah. that worked there that talked to with his mom and Brittany yeah. Hig, What's up? My, so, yeah, my mom was just at Jamestown two days ago when the uh, episode released of the indigenous thing. So my, the way my mom describes me there, she's like, yeah, my, my son, he's an archaeologist. Like, oh, where does he work? She's like, oh, yeah, he works in Ukraine. Kobe, I don't work in Ukraine. I did that for one summer. I That's not my thing. And then I guess they were listening to the podcast and my mom was like, oh, that's my son. And they were like really confused. And they're like, yeah, no, Carlton's my kid. And yeah. So those people that listen to this podcast probably know way more about my career than my own mother when she thinks I work in Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I just want to mention kind of my experience because like yeah, you, yeah. You, you can, you can, you can visit Alamos out here in Colorado and you get some early Spanish history, like early folks really getting into America. And it's like, it's super ephemeral. It's not very prominent. It, you know, it's hard really to connect to like this deep history, but going to Boston and actually seeing these locations preserved prominently, well-funded, well-kept is, it, it was, it was such a interesting experience to me, especially when all these places are surrounded by skyscrapers, like, like the, like the historic context uh-huh. is completely lost. If you think of like uh historic preservation and, and section 106 and all that stuff, like the, the context is really lost to folks, but actually seeing these standing buildings was something that was truly like momentous to me because we don't get that out here. And if we do, it's ephemeral and maybe like, like an old church in the ground or some leftover right. trinkets or something like that. Like that's, that's what it, it was just, it was just a surreal experience, especially because modern, modern society grew up and existed or now exists around these places, but they kept them yeah. there, which is super interesting to me. That's a cool point, man. And like, I like I, I Carlton can agree like as kids like I took it for granted for sure and I remember being on like a walking tour in New York, New York City as a kid and like <laughs> we were literally passed by this little cemetery and it said Alexander Hamilton and they were like well, this is Alexander Hamilton's grave and I was like looking around not caring and I was like oh I know that name I think he died <laughs> and then like walked but like now if I would have been especially with Hamilton being out I would have been like oh cool let's take an Instagram post but like <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we also went to Monticello, which is Thomas Jefferson's home, Mount Vernon, which is Washington's home. I used to bike ride around Mount Vernon. And like last time I was back home, my friends had bottles of wine from the Washington vineyards that they started pumping back out. So that's, that was always just in our face. And when I tell other people that they get like really excited, I'm like, well, you know, when you grow up there, that's just kind of, that's just kind of how it is. You know, you just take it for granted. I mean, like I said earlier in, at the beginning of the episode, one of my first experiences with archaeology, looking for this star fort that Washington supposedly built in Loudoun County during the Seven Years War on his way to Pennsylvania to get his ass whooped. And we found it via Google Maps and we had to be like, and it was in this star fort is being shared by like six or seven backyards in a suburb. And we had to be like really careful. Like we just kind of showed up to these people's houses like, hey, we just can we just see your backyard for anything. And I don't know if anything ever went with it because we don't want people to know where it is and how the county because it's private land type of thing. And it's not disturbed. It's just a hill in someone's backyard. So good luck if you listen to this and you want to find it. Yeah. If you want to go upset upper middle class people and their McMansions. Go for it. Um, that's, that's super interesting oh, to me because it's just I don't that stuff isn't preserved out here and it just doesn't it isn't like we don't have these big hills and and buildings and stuff like that so it's i i love i love that part of history and i think that's why i romanticize it more than anything like that because it's just colorado's like me growing up out east though like it's just it's like living at the beach like it, it's not as interesting and like for you out there it's like we always imagine people in colorado like wrestling with bears and like skiing and like that's that cool like later american history that's like you know the the idealism and like manifest destiny and all that like i want to go out west that sounds cool i'm um, digging holes in the ground so, and I mean, then having to record those <laughs> that's all the, <laughs> the mining yeah, industry out here is slave fun. labor out west <laughs> yeah yeah um but I, I guess something that we hammered in a few times here in the podcast is like or in this episode that the revolution was like started and founded in like our early nation conceived by young unfortunately white dudes and and their wives in their prime uh who were educated intelligent and like knew how to 
send a very long test message, text message to King George saying like, <laughs> we're breaking up. And like he responded with, okay. It was a drunk um, text too. This is like being done at a bar too. Like <laughs> there's so sure. many levels to this. <laughs> but like we, we had like the Iroquois Confederacy come down and like tell us about like their way. I mean, it, and I don't think it happened as, as well as like they tell it in the books, but like they had such a cool representative democracy that we were like, okay, how do you guys do things? Cause we need to form it this way. But the main thing was that these smart dudes who were educated made a country that was like, we're not going to have an aristocracy. We're not going to have knights. We're not going to call each other, sir. And things like that. And like, we're going to vote for each other and we're going to put each other <laughs> into like office. And we don't want to be what we just separated from, which is why Washington was like, I don't want to be King. I want to be, you know, I'll represent you as a president. And like, I think that's a cool thing. And like, we could argue that the American experiment is like failed <laughs> in like a lot of ways. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go into that, but like, we still like, we are a superpower after World War II. Like we, we literally, it, it was made by grad students in a bar and a lot and of I'm, dead young men. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And on, on that note, I want to throw out some lit recommendations. I really recommend, um, even though David hates him and that's going to be his new nemesis i recommend 1776 by david mccullough there's a series uh, at yeah, washington crossing there's a series of books uh, by nathaniel philbrick sure. who just dropped he there's one about um bunker hill uh, one about uh kind of cornwallis and in, in, in yorktown and there's also one about benedict arnold um so I, I highly recommend that series of books anything else guys uh the patriot uh, that's a good one. Washington Spies. That's another good one. I think the one, oh God, what is he who plays that does the, I think it's like the Delaware Crossing, that whole thing in New Jersey. Trenton, I think it might be called. That's a good one. I mean, like there's so many pop culture references. I don't think I have actually like Revolutionary War books. I just have some of my stuff from Washington's Crossing is real good. David yeah. Ike Fisher won the Pulitzer Prize. Most old white dudes in this country, like middle-aged guys, just eat Revolutionary War stuff up because it's well documented and like it's a, it is a cool period of history and it's a big market. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there, but just make sure it's like an academic source, not like a, here's what I think happened. <laughs> yeah, don't <laughs> read Bill O'Reilly's book on it. Oh, he has a book on it? Uh, yeah, I bet he does. Killing, he has all that killing series where he's like, killing Osama bin Laden, killing George Washington. <laughs> yeah, he's just got this like, he's got this whole like, don't read those. Or any of his compatriots. Adams is also another really good docuseries. I like Adams. John Adams? Yeah. yeah. That, that That's H a wonderful HBO yeah. series. You also see a guy get tarred and feathered and you like, you always thought like, Oh, that's a cute thing. Like you just dump tar on somebody and stick feathers to them. But like, no, it was like scalding hot tar and like rips your skin off. Like it's And then they cool. put you on a board and as you're like, naked, just parade you, around. parade you around town. It's yeah. yeah. And that's so that was uh, all, a lot of that was based on uh, the John Adams, David McCullough book. So David, books. go, yeah. go, go. <laughs> I've read it. It's a go, good book. Go thing. beep yourself. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to take the, the, the rating, the podcast and I just, just please. I was playing us out. Sorry, I didn't realize <laughs> No, Please so speak. also, if you guys didn't know, we have a store now. You can also find a Life and Ruin swag on the APN store. Please go support them and check that stuff out. We have that still that hashtag agriculture Our thing from net. way com. back in. Yeah, we have our own on Redbubble. You can find us there. We'll be adding more merch items. Right now, you can get stickers. Redbubble.com t-shirts slash a life in ruins. Yep, Redbubble.com slash people slash a life in ruins. There you go. Leave us a review. Go to our website sometime. You can find our Instagram and our podcast feed there and a couple other fun facts about us that's a life and and you can find us on arc podnet slash ruins for the youtube videos so you can find us on youtube and also if you want to see the videos on arc podnet it'd be great if you guys could become members for the apn five bucks a month really help us out if you guys support the arc pod archaeology podcast network you're supporting us and we really need support our producers would really uh thank you guys for it they put all this time into bringing you guys a show that you can listen to so yeah and do and, that and, um you get ad free uh content and early early releases on episodes when you're a member and you could also talk with us on slack there's a whole slack channel where you can converse with us directly so there's a lot of perks to being a part being a member of the apn so please please go there pay some money and uh, help support us and archaeological research yeah and one more thing to note is like chris webster and his wife rachel like literally edit every single one of the podcasts on the network it's a lot of work and they kind of do it for free and for fun so like 
it does help us all out. And, you know, if we can, you know, get the memberships and like, even if you help us out a little bit, it helps the network out and stuff like that. So and if yeah. you want to sponsor us, get advertisements, reach out to us. Me undies. Uh, where, where are we at? Come on, <laughs> come out here. Better help. Adam and Eve, whoever, who was the guy oh. that we got emailed the other day? The one that was on Instagram. What were they oh, called? Oh, the, the balls thing. The balls thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. We can't. We balls. can't. Yeah, it's like my yeah. balls. They wanted us to sponsor for us. They wanted to it's sponsor us, and we just can't do that. Not for sh- shinyballs.com or whatever it was. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyone listening, if you know of some good advertisement people that like we could, because we're look, we're actively looking for people to sponsor us. It really, it helps us out. It's money. If you know someone that would be good, like, you know, just someplace or you have a connection or you got an uncle, or you got a guy, uh, hook us up. All right. And that, with that, we are out. Come back next week for the Vietnam episode. <laughs> just lots of Charlie's in the tree. Thanks for listening to a Life in Ruins podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at a Life in Ruins podcast. And you can also email us at a Life in Ruins podcast at gmail.com. And remember, make sure to bring your archaeologists in from the cold and feed them beer. So, uh, gents, who is a dog's favorite founding father? Oh, um, give me a second. Give me a second. Uh, does it relate to Hancock in some way, shape, or form? It's close. Uh, what was the joke? Bone Franklin. What's a dog? <laughs> oh. Oh, my gosh. Boo. Um, Boo. It's painful. How come there's no <laughs> knock-knock jokes? Or- <laughs> how come there's no knock-knock jokes about America? <laughs> Why? Because let freedom ring. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. I got one more. I got one more. Okay. Uh, what was the Patriots' favorite food in the Revolutionary War? Uh, uh, Benedict. Eggs Benedict. Close. Chicken cacciatore. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, funny because Hessian prisoners. All right. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>